very good evening a very warm welcome myself ashwarya nair welcome you all on behalf of the family community for today's webinar on celiac disease by dr deepak madhusudan i'm thankful to all the participants from all over the country who have taken out their valuable time and are attending this evening talk family community has been created with the charter to provide free webinars by doctors and family doctors organizing this event would not have been possible without the help of my core committee members and the newly joined family community members thanks to everybody uh, i would also like to thank all the speakers who have contributed towards the social educational cause a social educational cause was uh, featured on atmanirbhar bharat my government site so i would also like to thank all the speakers as well as the government officials who are supporting this uh, social educational cause our uh, upcoming lecture number 4 in the gastroenterology series is on this saturday that is february 26 pm uh, it's a lecture on chronic pancreatitis and the lecture number 5 is on malabsorption syndrome and uh, it is on sunday and the timing is 6 pm i'm thankful to our speaker for our speaker for today that is dr deepak madhu sir for accepting our invitation and he's one of india's eminent gastroenterologist i'll hand over the session to my teammate vaishnavi to introduce our speaker for today thank you aishwarya it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today dr deepak madhu sir sir has done md mrcp member of royal college of physicians uk sir is trained in gastroenterology at all india institute of medical sciences new delhi dr deepak sir has special interest in inflammatory bowel disease and therapeutic endoscopy sir is currently working at caritas hospital kottayam and is actively involved in research and has published multiple articles in international journals sir was recipient of outstanding poster presenter award at american college of gastroenterologists annual conference 2020 he won poster of distinction at digestive disease week 2020 in chicago dr deepak sir is peer reviewer for several international journal journals with this brief introduction i would like to welcome our respected speaker for today dr deepak madhu sir over to you sir um thanks a lot vaishnavi for the kind words of invitation Uh, you know introduction and uh, aishwarya for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to uh, such a uh, large audience of interested and academically interested people so i i think uh, we'll just uh, we'll pass on to the topic right away Uh, uh can you see my yes sir your screen is visible right yes sir the presentation is also visible so you can you can see my uh, slides right yes, yes sir. sir your slides are visible now okay uh, so the the topic for today is uh, celiac disease thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to present on celiac disease so uh this uh you know many of you may already be knowing a lot of about this disease and uh you know needs no introduction it's a it's a, a malabsorption syndrome or an intestinal disease it's a disease predominantly affecting and uh, Uh, participants please do stay tuned 
there is some technical issue. Uh, so we are solving that. So kindly stay tuned. I'll just contact the speaker and uh, get it solved. So uh, I request everybody on YouTube uh, to stay tuned, and we apologize for the inconvenience caused to you. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, where, where did we? Uh, where did you lose me exactly? At the first slide, second slide. So the first slide. So is it is it clear right now? Yes, sir. Now, uh, now it is clear, sir. Uh, your screen sharing has been stopped, sir. Okay. So the thing is, uh, celiac disease. Uh, I mean, uh, a lot of you must already be aware of celiac uh, uh, disease, and uh, a lot of you may have, in fact, done research on celiac disease. Some of you may, you know, uh, be, you know, in the initial phases of, of of learning about celiac disease. So, what I try to do here, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. So what I what I am trying to do today is give a brief introduction to celiac disease. This is no, by no means uh, an exhaustive review of celiac disease. Uh, a, a, a brief uh, introduction to celiac disease, uh, something which uh, a lot of uh, you can build upon. So celiac disease may not be of much interest to the PharmD community. I don't know how much interest it is to the farm PharmD community, mostly because. Drugs are not the mainstay of treatment, and there are very few drugs that are actually uh, involved in the management of celiac disease. Sir, so, I'm extremely sorry to disturb you, sir. So your yeah. screen sharing has been stopped, so you will have to reshare it. Yes, sir. Now it is visible. Sir. So celiac disease is a uh, a chronic, lifelong disease. It's immune mediated. Predominantly affects the small intestine. Is precipitated by gluten and occurs in genetically predisposed individuals. So what exactly is gluten? Gluten is a, a protein that is present in uh, uh, some cereals. Most importantly, wheat. Uh, it confers the unique baking quality to wheat. It has uh, two main fractions, gliadins and glutenins. Gliadins are the soluble fraction and glut glutenins are the insoluble fraction. Both fractions have high glutamine and proline contents. So which of these fractions actually is involved in the pathogenesis of celiac disease? It's the gliadin fraction, which is predominantly involved in triggering celiac disease. So which are the grains which contain gluten? Wheat, we, we all know wheat contains gluten. Uh, rye and barley also contain wheat, uh, gluten. And there's this lesser known cereal called triticale, which also has uh, uh, large amounts of gluten. And among gluten-free grains, oats is one cereal which has uh, gluten in, uh, in modest amounts. And uh, this is of importance, which we'll be discussing uh, in subsequent slides. So, uh, wheat is the staple diet in a large uh, part of India. Most of uh, the uh, most of northern India 
has heavy consumption of uh, wheat. So it's important that uh, we know about celiac disease because all of these, uh, it, it has to be in genetically predisposed, it, it occurs only in genetically predisposed individuals, but even in genetically predisposed individuals, it occurs only on exposure to gluten. So large parts of India where the per capita consumption of uh, wheat is as low as zero or negligible, celiac disease may not manifest, even though the tendency is there because the exposure, of, uh, exposure to gluten is minimal. So wheat related intestinal disorders, uh, celiac disease is not the only wheat related intestinal disorder. There is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Many people uh, doubt the existence of this entity, but you know, it, it is still recognized uh, in the scientific community as a legitimate organic disease. So we'll be you know, briefly touching upon that as well. And then there's wheat allergy. How, how do these three diseases differ from each other? So <clears throat> celiac disease is, auto, is an autoimmune disease uh, in, uh, triggered, you know, uh, in both innate and adaptive immunity is uh, involved in the, you know, pathogenesis of celiac disease, predominantly adaptive immunity. Innate immunity alone is involved in the pathogenesis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity and uh, uh, wheat allergy is uh, uh, predominantly an allergic disorder. So uh, I, I guess most of us are from India. So I, I, I'll touch upon the epidemiology of uh, celiac disease in India. Until a few decades ago, celiac disease was uh, thought to be non-existent in India. And it was thought to be predominantly a uh, uh, disease uh, affecting Caucasians. But uh, the, the prevalence of celiac disease was found to be as much as 1%, which is, which is similar to that in the West, in Northern India. Subsequently, uh, you know, people working in South India, this was a study which was done in, uh, the, in, in the Northern part of India. Subsequently, researchers uh, from North and South India combined to conduct a large scale epidemiologic study, which was published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, I think in 2016 in which they had uh, demonstrated that uh, symptomatic celiac disease is very, very, very infrequent in South India, whereas it is fairly common uh, in uh, uh, North India. South and North, Northeastern India, it's less uh, common. So why? We all know why. We, uh, uh, because, uh, the entire Northeast and Southern part of India consumes uh, nil or very negligible amounts of uh, wheat. But on the other hand, uh, there are states, uh, you know, like Gujarat, Rajasthan, Punjab, Haryana, where uh, the consumption of uh, wheat is, per capita consumption of wheat is very high. So how does wheat, uh, how does gluten uh, cause celiac disease? What's the pathogenesis? So like I said, glu uh, gluten has two uh, components, gliadin and uh, glutenin. Gliadin fragment, um, you know, I, I'll just cut a long story short. The gliadin fra fragments induce, uh, you know, uh, the tight junctions between cells to loosen up, they enter the lamina propria. <clears throat> so the entry to, uh, the first step is tight, uh, loosening of the tight junctions. They enter the lamina propria. And it, once the, it's only after they enter the lamina propria that they trigger an uh, immune response. So uh, there's a systemic in, uh, immune response, which you know results in uh, a lot of extra intestinal manifestations. And there is the, <clears throat> Uh, local effect uh, triggered by immunity, which results in uh, uh, intestinal ap apoptosis leading to uh, death of uh, intestinal cells, enterocytes leading to 
villus atrophy. So, like I said, it results in sub, uh, substantial amount of intestinal and extraintestinal uh, inflammation, systemic in inflammation as well. And so the symptoms can be gastrointestinal as well as extraintestinal. Gastrointestinal symptoms predominate in most people, in most of the classic celiac disease patients, gastrointestinal manifestations predominate. It could be just bloating and distension, as simple as bloating and distension. They could have diarrhea, steatoria, malabsorption, and weight loss, which is, you know, at the other end of the spectrum. Dyspepsia on, on the, you know, the, the least severe spectrum, end of the spectrum, and uh, malabsorption syndrome with weight loss at the, the most severe end of the, end of the spectrum. Extraintestinal manifestations include anemia, which is directly probably linked to the malabsorption itself, hypospinism, osteopenia, osteo uh, dermatitis, herpetiformis, peripheral neuropathy, ataxia, epilepsy, depression. This is not an exhaustive list. It, th there is a wide range of problems that are caused by celiac disease. This is just a you know tip of the iceberg. So what what what? How do we diagnose celiac disease? So there are four components um, in the diagnosis. The first three are, you can say, mandatory in adults. Uh, serology, endoscopy, and histology. Whereas HLA is uh, performed only <clears throat> when there's a discordance. In uh, children, the diagnosis of pediatric population, the diagnosis, I'll, I'll not be touching about pe pediatric uh, celiac disease. It's an entire... Uh, please do wait. Uh, we apologize that uh, we are having some fanwork. Please stay still. Yes, Sarah has joined with us. So, uh, uh, had you seen this slide? Yes, sir. We have, we have seen the slide and uh, you were saying that I'm not going to touch upon pediatric. Uh, yeah. Okay. So pediatric. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the diagnosis of celiac disease in uh, in pediatric population depends almost entirely on uh, serology alone in most cases. Uh, whereas in adults, sero serology, uh, endoscopy, and histology are uh, uh, mandatory in the diagnosis and classification of uh, celiac disease. HLA is done in adults only when there is a discordance between uh, 
the other tests and if there's a diagnostic confusion. So serology, um, the <clears throat> we'll be we, uh, there are two main categories of antibodies which are in, in, uh, which are important in the diagnosis of celiac disease. One is the uh, autoantibodies, and the other uh, the other group of antibodies are antibodies uh, targeting gliadin. The autoantibodies are. Uh, uh, endomycel antibody IgA and uh, tissue transglutaminase antibodies, which are which can be IgA as well as IgG. Antibodies targeting gliadin can be uh, AGA, IgA as well as IgG. Uh, Deaminated gliadin peptide antibodies, antibodies against DGP can be IgA as well as uh, IgG. Endomycel antibody is IgA alone. This is important because uh, immunoglobulin A deficiency, selective IgA deficiency is very commonly associated with celiac disease. And the diagnosis of uh, celiac disease when uh, immunoglobulin A deficiency coexists would depend on IgG antibodies. <clears throat> so, Endoscopy. Endoscopy uh, uh, is uh, 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 serology would be the first step in screening of uh, people who are suspected to have celiac disease. Endoscopy would be the next step. Mucus uh, when uh, serology is positive. Um, endoscopy. The features uh, you are looking for uh, to diagnose celiac disease include mucosal atrophy, loss of folds in the duodenum, visible fissures nodularity and scalloping. I'll, I'll briefly show you a picture so that you'll get a clearer idea. So these are the villi you, that can be seen on endoscopy. These are the villi. This is the normal total mucosa and you can see villi uh, 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 in the duodenum. So when it gets atrophic, the villi are less prominently seen and sometimes uh, in more advanced cases, fissuring may be seen like this. And uh, widespread fissuring and uh, scalloping would look like this. You know, you know what a scallop is. So the surface of the, the, the duodenal folds look scalloped um, in advanced celiac disease uh, many, uh, very often uh, while uh, evaluating by endoscopy. <clears throat> so once we've done an endoscopy, we would like to get a biopsy from uh, duodenum, four biopsies from the second part of duodenum and two biopsies from the first part of duodenum. You send the biopsies for histopathologic examinations. There, uh, examination. there are four things that they are looking for in, in it to diagnose celiac disease by histology. The increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes, villus atrophy, enhanced epithelial apoptosis, and crypt hyperplasia. So this is <clears throat> the, these are normal villi which are seen on pathologic examination. You can see. So this is uh, you know picture showing increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. So this is partial villus atrophy, and this is total villus atrophy. You can see that the villi are partially atrophic here. They're short, blunted, and stout. And the crypts are hypoplastic. This is more advanced celiac disease where there is total villus atrophy. The villi are almost non-existent. And the crypts, the crypts are hypoplastic. So what happens when uh, villi are, uh, villi, get, uh, villi get damaged? What happens when villi are atrophic? What is the function of the normal villi? The, the normal villi are important in you know absorption. So when villi get uh, atrophic, you can expect malabsorption. The next is HLA DQ2 DQ8, useful when serology and histology are discordant. Celiac disease is ruled out if HLA DQ2 and DQ8 is negative. So when 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 uh, you know you rule out celiac disease, this is the test 
you're looking forward to. So what is the algorithm uh, when a patient is suspected to have celiac disease? Do IgA tissue transglutaminase and serum IgA together. If IgA is deficient, you're looking G antibodies, IgG, uh, tissue transglutaminase or DGP. Low titers, uh, positive at low titer. Positive at low titers. Uh, you can still hear me, right? Yes, sir. So when it's positive at low, low titers, you may have to repeat an IgA endomycial antibody. So the, so the second step is duodenal biopsy when uh, you know it's positive at high titers, uh, IgA or IgG as the case may be. When it's negative with normal IgA, it's virtually ruled out. So when it's positive, conclusively positive, you proceed for duodenal biopsy. Uh, so uh, at duodenal biopsy, you're looking forward to villus atrophy. When villus atrophy and uh, 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 seropositivity is present, you've diagnosed celiac disease. When it's negative, you have this entire algorithm where you look for reasons why it's negative. So it could be because the villus atrophy is patchy. You may have sampled the wrong area. You may have to rebiopsy. And if the rebiopsy is also normal, you rule out celiac disease. If the uh, biopsy, and then check if the biopsy is correct orientation. If it's uh, oriented well and it's not patchy villus atrophy, you uh, test for HLA DQ2 DQ8. If it's positive, it's uh, it could be celiac disease. Still, if it's negative, you ruled out celiac disease. So, if if villus atrophy is present and uh, serology is negative, you you can uh, consider other causes of uh, villus atrophy like autoimmune enteropathy, common variable immunodeficiency, HIV, intestinal lymphoma, whole lot of stuff. When HLA, when HLA DQ2 DQ8 is positive and, uh, and uh, it's uh, seronegative, uh, you, you may have to do uh, 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 look for response with gluten-free diet. And then label it as uh, seronegative CD, chronic celiac disease if there is clin clinical improvement after one year of gluten-free diet. So, uh, so celiac disease, when you've done all tests, all the three tests that are involved, that is endoscopy, histology, and um, serology, uh, you have the results with you. You have to classify, uh, if it's positive, you have to classify it. You have to put it in one of these categories. Symptomatic celiac disease and asymptomatic celiac disease. Symptomatic celiac disease can be when, when, when the patient has classical symptoms like diarrhea, malabsorption, weight loss. So when the patient presents with these symptoms and there is villus atrophy with serology positivity, you, die, you classify it as classic celiac disease. When the symptoms are atypical, like uh, when, when, when it's osteoporosis alone, iron deficiency, anemia, or one of the extra intestinal manifestations like dermatitis, uh, herpetiformis, etc., you diagnose it as atypical celiac disease when both villus atrophy and serology are positive. When the patient is asymptomatic, and uh, there is villus atrophy and serology positivity, you diagnose it as silent celiac disease. This is most commonly seen in epidemiologic studies. When you tested the patient for, uh, to, for uh, the prevalence of celiac disease in studies, you get uh, patients who are asymptomatic but are positive for serology and villus atrophy. They are silent celiac uh, disease patients. They are asymptomatic. They, they're called silent celiac disease. And then the, there's latent celiac disease where there is no villus atrophy. Serology is positive and HLA DQ2, DQ8 are positive. So it's celiac disease, but uh, it's, it's asymptomatic. It has not caused uh, enough intestinal damage yet. It, can, it may in the future, but it has not yet. So asymptomatic celiac disease can be silent or latent. 
and symptomatic celiac disease can be classic can uh, be classic or atypical class depending on what kind of symptoms the patient presents with so uh 27% of patients present with typical classical celiac disease symptoms so 52 patients present with atypical uh celiac disease and uh, subclinical celiac disease can be seen in up to 21% of patients in the study uh, uh conducted uh, some time back so treatment of celiac disease so once you've diagnosed celiac disease and the patient is symptomatic you need to treat it uh, it's multi pronged the the mainstay of treatment is gluten avoidance always it uh, they may require nutritional support as well and then management of extra intestinal manifestations as well so so how do you modify diet in these patients so it it goes without saying that wheat rye and barley needs to be excluded from the diet um food additives such as you know uh, ketchup for example may have it's to, you think it's tomato ketchup but sometimes ketchup can also contain gluten and uh, you know food additives uh, uh, may contain gluten and uh, may contribute to inadvertent ingestion of gluten you know uh, it's best to limit oats but if it has to be used it has to be used at a uh, at less than 50 grams per day and only in patients with mild disease or in patients in remission in case of uh, worsening with uh, oats uh, it's uh, it's it should be it should not be continued in any case in, in if there's worsening of symptoms of worsening of uh, serology with uh, oats consumption uh, it should be avoided altogether for uh, fermented foods such as beer and malt vinegar may contain gluten but when it's uh, distilled beverages for example whiskey is uh, is distilled uh, is a distilled beverage made from a gluten containing cereal malt but because it's distilled it contains uh, you know uh, very uh, small amounts of gluten trace amounts of gluten only and uh, need not be and uh, whiskey need not be restricted but because it's a distilled beverage um, but uh, beer uh, is best restricted uh, foods uh, you know labeled as gluten free foods should contain less than 100 parts per million of gluten so uh, when uh, people with celiac disease they should be on a gluten free diet and if they are buying gluten free products they should ensure that the it is labeled with uh the parts per million uh the they should ensure that uh, the labeling contain uh, labeling ensures that the uh concentration of gluten is less than 100 parts per million <laughs> once a patient is on a gluten free diet you expect symptom uh, symptomatic response the symptoms to resolve by around 4 to 8 weeks the serology iga uh, the initial serology which was positive which was used in the diagnosis of celiac disease you expect it to come down by 6 to 12 months and the histology to normalize by <clears throat> around 12 months they should be on lifelong gluten free diet but uh, 5% of uh, celiac disease patients do not respond to a gluten free diet so when um, they do not respond to a gluten free diet it could be due to non adherence inadvertent in ingestion like uh, you know like like uh, if they contain uh, if they you continuing to use food additives uh, uh, i mean uh, food products that contain additives that contain gluten they still can have uh in inadvertent gluten ingestion leading on to uh, you know persistent symptoms and uh, positive serology coexistent disorders <clears throat> can also contribute to coexistent uh, disorders like for example crohn's disease 
is another malabsorption syndrome that is seen uh, that is known to be associated with celiac disease. If a patient has a coexistent Crohn's disease, even if the patient is on uh, gluten-free diet, he may not be he or she may not be fully um, symptom-free because the Crohn's disease has to be treated as well. And thus, refractory celiac disease, it's, it's a complicated topic. We won't be touching upon refractory disease um, in this seminar. So, extra-intestinal manifestations, man, uh, intestinal manifestations almost always respond to celiac disease, except in the 5% of cases which we uh, discussed a little while ago. But uh, extra-intestinal manifestations may not always respond to a gluten-free diet and requires separate assessment and uh, management. So there are drugs being evaluated in the management of celiac disease, but uh, there's only one drug that has uh, reached uh, phase three, that is uh, azotide acetate. It's a locally acting amino acid uh, 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 eight amino acid peptide. It's a tight junction regulator. We, we, we discussed a little while ago that, uh, you know, entry of the gliadin to, um, entry of the gliadin to the lamina propria is necessary. Entry of the uh, gliadin to the lamina propria is necessary for uh, 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 gliadin to or gluten to trigger the in, uh, immune response. So if it does not enter the uh, lamina propria, it, it, it's less likely to uh, uh, trigger the immune response that's responsible for the symptoms and uh, uh, inflammation that's seen in celiac disease. So this, what larazotide does is it, it uh, regulates a tight junction so that the gliadin or gluten does not enter the lamina propria uh, where it has potential to, to trigger the inflammatory response. This was evaluated in a, a randomized control trial and uh, which was published a couple of years back in uh, gastroenterology. Uh, 0.5 milligram of larazotide acetate had reduced symptoms and signs of celiac disease on uh, in patients with on a gluten-free diet. It's, it's an ad, adjunct to uh, gluten-free diet in the sense that gluten-free patients were more likely to be symptom-free if they received both gluten-free diet and larazotide acetate than patients with gluten-free diet alone. So that, that's the only, um, this, this drug has not yet uh, reached uh, this uh, this uh, drug has not yet reached uh, the marketing stage it's not yet available yet but uh, it is completed uh, a phase three trial in the united states a couple of years back so thanks a lot this was you know in brief an introduction to celiac disease so this was uh, the, the International Celiac Disease Symposium, which is the, the largest conference on celiac disease. It was for the first time held outside the North Atlantic in 2017, and it was in India. For the first time, they had conducted uh, it anywhere outside uh, North Atlantic. So this was a stamp that was designed at that time um, to uh, commemorate the uh, occasion. So this briefly shows the pathogenesis of celiac disease. Normal villi in a wheat field leads to villus atrophy. So these villi you can see uh, are getting atrophied. And uh, what the artist has shown here is the ICDS, International Celiac Disease Symposium, to be throwing light on this disease. So what was a, a, a disease that was thought to not exist in India has become 
uh, a common disease as is now known to be a common disease in india and research from india is uh, is getting appreciated the world over uh, and the ICDS 2017 which was held in india is uh, testimonial to the fact that research from india is being taken very seriously icds is the olympics of celiac disease to put it in a very uh, short way thanks a lot thank you very much i hope it was an informative session we'll uh, look forward to the questions yeah thank you so much sir thank you for delivering such an informative session as we were uh, streaming live on youtube there are a couple of questions that we have received via a youtube channel and also there were a few questions from our registration forms so i would like to take a couple of them so the first question is from youtube uh, okay. how to manage hyperkeratosis in women with celiac disease so this this is not a um, um, Uh, i mean uh, it, it's not uh, something which i manage on my own i am a gastroenterologist it's usually the uh, uh, dermatologist which manages this so um, i'm not sure what the answer is if if anyway gluten free diet is anyway required uh, anything else would be the dermatologist uh, domain okay uh, thank you so much sir so the next question yeah. is is corticosteroids used for the treatment of celiac disease yes it's used in uh, refractory celiac disease it's used in the treatment of refractory celiac disease it's a, it's a different it's a very complicated and uh, different topic altogether but uh, uh, the mainstay of treatment still remains gluten free diet if the patient has uh, Uh, not responded to gluten free diet and uh, all of the causes such as in inadvertent gluten ingestion or non compliance are excluded and uh, uh, and you further diagnose uh, uh, a refractory celiac disease then you may have to uh, treat the patient with steroids as well steroids uh, immunomodulators uh, or uh, even mesalamine um, there are a whole lot of uh, drugs that are tried in refractory celiac disease yes okay thank you sir so the next question is is there any correlation between vitamin d deficiency and celiac disease in children yes uh, celiac disease does lead on to vitamin d deficiency it it does lead on to vitamin d deficiency okay thank you sir so the next question is again from youtube one participant has asked how severe can be a uh, celiac disease so celiac disease is not usually it's not common for celiac disease to be severe it's usually you know uh, uh, most people just have you know it's it does it does not usually present in a fulminant fashion or in a life threatening manner but there can be instances where patients present in a fulminant manner with Uh, uh, diarrhea that has dehydrated them, which has led uh, di uh, dehydration, which has led on to hypertension and kidney injury, dehydration. All sorts of things can theoretically occur, but it's very infrequently seen. But it 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 surely can occur. And uh, the the uh, that's the acute presentation. That's when it a uh, patient presents acutely with the life threatening symptom of celiac disease. and uh, um in um, refractory celiac disease sometimes patients can uh, refractory celiac disease type 2 that is enteropathy they can develop uh, t cell lymphomas enteropathy associated t cell lymphoma and enteropathy associated t cell lymphoma is a, is a you know uh, is a disease with uh, uh, poor prognosis so these are instances these are uh, it's very uncommon you know if you look at the um, longevity of a patient with celiac disease and uh, without celiac disease it may not be vastly different but these are instances where celiac disease can present in a very serious manner if uh, you know and if a patient with celiac disease is not on gluten free diet um, again it can 
cause a whole lot of issues, quality, quality of life issues, um, uh, and uh, absences, absences from work, etc. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, okay. Thank you so much, sir. So that brings us to the end of the Q and A session. I now hand over the session to my teammate Vaishnavi to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Kuldeep. Uh, here we come to the end of our session. I'd like to thank our speaker, Dr. Deepak Madhu, sir, for this wonderful session. Thank you, sir, for sharing your valuable time and sharing with us your words of wisdom. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity, uh, Vaishnavi and uh, Aishwarya, and for the entire family community for interacting very well and listening eagerly. Okay. It's been a it's it's been a, a great uh, experience for me. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Same here. Yeah. Next time we will hope that uh, you know we we won't face the network issues we faced this time. You know, it was uh, uh, you know uh, 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 that that was the only trouble we faced. I think. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, but nowadays like. Everything is on time. Like we do face a bit of technical glitches, sir. Like that's the new normal right now. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but I would uh, like uh, next time I might really hope we won't face that. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And uh, the next week, uh, ne uh, what, what am I presenting next week? Thank you, sir. Next first week. Yeah, you are audible, Aishwarya. Yes, sir. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Uh, Aishwarya, you can continue with your announcement. Yeah. yeah. Uh, dear participants, as we are receiving uh, same queries again and again regarding the course, uh, the lectures, and also the certificates. I like and I request all our participants to please again make a note that all our lectures are on YouTube itself. Also, uh, the criteria for getting e certificate uh, is mentioned in brochure. Also, I'd like to mention it here. Uh, two assessment and one final assessment is mandatory with 50% of passing with your 80% attendance of our all lecture series and the certificate will be issued to at the end of the course as it's a course after the entire lecture series you'll get the e-certificate so uh, don't misunderstand that every lecture every uh, lecture will have another e-certificate so uh, make a note that your e-certificate will be issued towards the end of the course thank you so much <laughs>